I had a great time doing it. I would definitely do another one if I found another subject matter that I could happily talk about for hundreds of hours. All pop music is rearranged sparks. That's the truth. There are throwaway riffs that other bands have built whole careers out of. I'd say the entire production is like two and a half years. I personally did 80 interviews, 79 of which were in person. We filmed interviews in LA, New York, London, and then we also shot footage in LA, Mexico City, Tokyo, and London. So I got to go to Japan and Mexico with Sparks, which was a trip. For the interviews, we used the red Monstro. So we shot it in black and white, which I think gave the producers kittens at some points. They were like, really, you, get, you don't want to shoot it in color and then make it black and white? And we say, like, no, we want to use the red Monstro and shoot it in black and white. How many hours of Sparks did I listen to? Well, there's 25 albums. And I think sort of overall, we figured out that there's 345 songs. I'd heard the, all the music before, but obviously I went back in for another deep dive. So, but that's, you know, a pleasurable couple of days in the office listening to all of that. <laughs> music at its best, you hear it and you go, oh my God, what is that? It's insane, but it's fantastic. Congratulations on a fantastic documentary that I never knew I wanted you to make. It's a bit like the Candyman or something, is once I'd said out loud five times that there should be a documentary, eventually one of my friends called me on it, Phil Lord, in fact, the director, at a Sparks concert. I've been parroting the same thing for a while, saying, oh, somebody's got to make a documentary about Sparks. They're like the most influential band that don't have a documentary about them. And then Phil Lord eventually said, you should do it. And I was like, yeah, I will. And then as soon as I had said it out loud to Ronald Russell from Sparks, then it was like, I can't go back on that promise. I have to deliver. I was so in awe of their career, always with a fan base, but sometimes with kind of little commercial peaks and sometimes seemingly to kind of indifference from the mainstream, but like hugely influential and, and, with, and very unusually for a band of that age with like a growing fan base. <laughs> and that was, to me was quite, quite odd. I think in my pitch document, I had the phrase that actually ends up on the poster is like your favorite band's favorite band. Beck makes the point that he says there are probably bands now that are influenced by Sparks without realizing that the lineage goes back to them. And I think a lot of people who maybe didn't know them at the time or didn't grow up with them, when they hear the songs now, they're like, oh, wait, you know, this song sounds like LCD sound system. But this song is from 1979. And the LCD sound system song is from 2006. That's interesting. We have influenced everyone. Honestly, I don't want to see this movie. I don't want to learn too much about them. Um, I'll watch it because I'm in it. How would you explain Ron and Russell to someone that doesn't know anything about them? I think Ron and Russell is people are like, they're also unusual, is that they're the very rare brothers in rock who have not fallen out. Pretty much every other like band of brothers, Oasis, the Kinks, the Everly Brothers, all seem to hate each other's guts. <laughs> I guess it's pretty unusual to shoot a film about brothers who have worked together for like, you know, more than five decades to shoot them in a two shot. Because if you were doing a documentary about Oasis, you wouldn't have Noel and Liam Gallagher in the same shot. They wouldn't yeah. even be in the same building. And, and I sort of knew that because as I got to know them over the last like five years, I sort of realized that I'd never seen, and this was part of the kind of the riddle to solve or, or not rather, is that I'd never seen Sparks like off the clock. Because every time I'd seen Ron and Russell, they were kind of like exactly as they are on stage. I've only once seen Russell without Ron. I've never seen Ron without Russell. <laughs> so they're usually together decades later. I'm not sure they know where Ron and Russell end and Sparks start. They don't really look like a band. They do just like people who've been sort of let out for a day. What's going on? Oh my God. What is the scene that you watch and you were like, this is what the movie is all about. It's this crucial moment. And the great thing about Ron and Russell is that even when things are tough, they're sort of unfailingly cheery and they've got the kind of head screwed on that they're able to look back very objectively. And that's kind of an odd thing to sort of like be able to sort of see the funny side of like the tough times. It's ironic that they do have a, a major musical coming out at Cannes, opening Cannes this year. Because back in the 80s, they effectively stopped doing Sparks to make a film with Tim Burton. 
And that was in sort of development for six years. And during that six years, they basically stopped releasing music because like Tim Burton in the late 80s is probably like the hottest director on the planet and Sparks and something that they came to regret, like put like everything on that, put all their chips on that movie happening. And then it did not come together. You know, I remember when I was trying to get Baby Driver off the ground, I really wanted to do Baby Driver, but like you never quite know whether something's going to get green lit. So you're kind of like trying to sort of keep your fingers in some other pies just in case like three years suddenly disappears. And it's it's really tough. And I think Ron and Russell, like there was a lesson learned in terms of like, it wasn't wrong to keep working on that movie, but we probably should have had a plan B ready to go. After I'd shot last night in Soho and we'd effectively got all of our interviews for Sparks, then we heard that Annette was happening. And so the last bit of filming that I did was on the set of Annette. I was like, we have to go to Brussels and we have to interview them on the set of Annette because if Annette hadn't come together, like the film might be missing an emotional climax in the way. percent, yes. <laughs> I was happy on two fronts that Annette happened is A, I want to see the movie. B, it gave me like a little bit of closure at the end of the documentary. They've reinvented themselves several times. The thing that marked them was their unwillingness to give up. That sounds like the scene from our biopic. <laughs> what do you want the audience to take from Spark's long career? And is there anything that you intend to apply to your own now moving forward? It's all about success and failure on your own terms. Because the worst kind of failure is if you weren't sure about something and it's like, I didn't want to do that thing anyway. And then it like was awful and it didn't do well. And that's like the worst. If it's something that you're already proud of and it doesn't do well, then it's like, wait. Like, you know, with their albums, it's like they've had albums that did absolutely nothing. And then like strangely, like sort of 30 years later, people go back saying, hey, you know what? Introducing Sparks, the 1977 album is great. Like in the documentary, Flea talks about that at length. And Ronald Russell were watching that saying like, who would have thought that Flea was a big fan of introducing, which did nothing when it came out. It's that thing is that success, it cannot just be measured in sales and likes on social media. And success cannot be necessarily measured immediately. We know this from like tons of films. I know from one of the films that I made that like didn't do well initially, but 10 years later, it seems like everybody's seen it. <laughs> like so, so what that really means deep down is that you sort of just got to trust your gut artistically and make sure that if you can, like what you're doing, you're proud of. The reason I'm here talking about them like 50 years after their first album is because you can't watch what they did and not be in some kind of awe that they kept going. Because there's points in the documentary that like most other bands, there's probably about seven or eight points where most other bands would have like just jacked it in. What an amazing thing to have like a documentary about your life and the opening film at the Cannes Film Festival in the same year. As Sparks as well, like not as Ron and Russell, like in the trailer for Annette it says featuring the music of Sparks. That's amazing. Why have you resisted doing a documentary until now? We didn't want to do the standard documentary full of talking heads. It would become too dry. 